All right, so today we're starting a web series in which I create a wiki engine. In other words, server software that operates, that allows you to operate a wiki. Uh, why would I do this? There's probably hundreds of wiki engines out there online. Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, I have a handful of websites I need to create content for, and wiki is my preferred form. I do not have any CMS that I like. And frankly, at this point, I think that this is going to be an interesting project. Um, there's a very limited number of wiki engines that run on IIS. In other words, the Windows slash ASP platform and Microsoft web server. I've taken a look at everything that's out there. And frankly, they all suck. Now, I could install MediaWiki, which would run on PHP, which I could get that's working in IIS, or I could install like WAMP server, which has Apache, but I've installed hundreds of MediaWiki installations in my life, and I know from experience that just fucking with the configuration, installing plugins, fucking with the code, trying to get it the way that I want it, I mean, even the styling and the, the themes is just a pain in the ass, so I feel like I could write the engine faster than it would take me to adapt some other engine to my needs. I mean, a wiki is not very complicated. You're just storing, editing, and displaying blobs of text. So I figure let's make a video series on it and show you guys how a modern ASP.NET Core web application, as it's called here in Visual Studio, works. As always, if there's anything that I'm doing that you disagree with or have questions about or think I could do easier, you know, shoot a comment down below. Um, otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're going to call this shitty wiki because initially it's going to be pretty, pretty fucking shitty. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create a blank uh, web application project. We're going to configure it for HTTPS because it's 2020 and we're adults. And in a second, it's going to create the basic blank empty template um, for ASP.NET Core, which if I, if I run it, this is what it looks like. Let's take a look. It'll take a second the first time. This is going to open up in a Chrome window, and this is basically the template that you get. So there's a home page and there's a privacy page, and that's pretty much it. So we're going to make a couple changes here real quick to the environment. The first one is if you look here, instead of running this in IIS, I'm going to use the project name as the build configuration. What's it, what that's going to do is um, it's going to run it as Kestrel, which is going to run in a console window. And that way I can you know, write log entries for debugging, which are going to show up here in the um, console window. So I don't have to do anything crazy to uh, to spit out verbose messages. I don't have to look at a file or the event log or whatever. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install some NuGet packages right off the bat so that we can get these out of the way. So um, we're going to be using Entity Framework Core, which is how we're going to interface with our database. It's our ORM. So I'm going to install Microsoft Entity Framework Core. And no, I don't want the preview version. I accept that. We're also going to install the SQL Server module because I'm going to be using a SQL Server. On my dev machine here, we're using SQL Server Express, which gets installed as part of Visual Studio. And I'm also going to install the tools package, which is required for the command line um, commands for doing migrations, which I'll explain that in about five, 10 minutes ish, what a migration is and how database development works under Entity Framework Core. Um, and then I'm also going to install one other thing, which is called Razor.Runtime Compilation. Um, this is going to allow me to make changes to my, my UI and load them immediately in my browser window without having to stop the whole project, recompile it, restart it, begin debugging again, because that, that's just a big pain in the ass. So now that these are installed, the next thing I'm going to do, let's go ahead and close this. I'm going to open my app settings.json file, and I'm going to add a connection string in here. So we're going to add a uh, object called connection strings, and in there I'm going to add a connection string for a database connection. So we're going to say the server is dot, which is essentially localhost. The database, we're going to call it shitty wiki, 
and trusted connection equals true. And this means it's gonna use Windows authentication, which means that I don't have to bake a credential anywhere into my program or put a credential into my config file. If I want my wiki to run as a different user, I, I would configure that in IIS. I don't need to worry about um, any kind of credential here. And we're also gonna do the same thing when we do user authentication. We're gonna use Active Directory, which is also gonna use integrated authentication, which means I really don't have to bake any kind of passwords, credentials, any kind of encrypted shit into my database. It'll be pretty straightforward and secure. All right, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add two classes. One of them is gonna represent my database context. I'm just gonna call the file db, and I'm gonna call the class database for simplicity. And I'm gonna add another class here called page. And this is gonna represent a wiki page. Um, I hope this isn't too confusing because we're gonna be talking both about wiki pages as well as razor pages, which are the actual user interface pages, but I will try to differentiate by calling them wiki page or razor page from here forward. So um, real quick, in our wiki page, there's gonna be a bunch of properties that each page has, but I'm just gonna start out by giving each one a unique ID so that we have a primary key in our database. There's gonna be all kinds of other stuff that we're gonna to add to this in a second, but this is just where I'm gonna start off with. And in our database, um, the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna inherit database context and I'm gonna import the Microsoft.Entity Framework core namespace. And this is gonna act as our proxy to the database. This is essentially gonna represent a database connection with one transaction at a time. So every time we interact with a web page on our website that talks to the database, it's gonna implicitly create one of these contexts, which is gonna to connect to the database if necessary and track whatever changes have to be made, all that good shit. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a constructor. So we're gonna do public database and we're gonna take some parameters. One of them is gonna be called DB context options of database. And this is gonna be used to set up the connection. And I'm just gonna put that in there. And then the other thing is we're gonna use dependency injection to, um, to create a logger, which is a type of beer. <laughs> And we're going to have this uh, constructor called the base constructor and pass those options along. And I'm also going to create a private reference to that logger so that I can keep track of it. So we're going to say logger equals logger. And I need to import the logging namespace for that to function properly. Now, the only other thing I want to do in the constructor, because, you know, there's going to be, at this point, there's no database created. Let me show you the SQL server. This over here, this over here on the left is the database server. I have a wiki database in here, but that's for a different project that I, I was doing for testing. There is no shitty wiki database in here. If you remember in my connection string, I said the database is going to be called shitty wiki. No such database exists. So the first thing that we want our piece of software to do is create the database if it has to be created. So we're gonna we're gonna use a function called database dot ensure created, and that's gonna make sure that the database is created. And if it is, then uh, actually we're gonna remove this. Uh, and if it was created, if it had to be created, this is gonna return true. And then at this point, I'm gonna use the logger and just log a text string to the console. It basically just says created database, just so that we can kind of see at what point that occurs. Now I'm going to go ahead and go into my startup class that was automatically generated by the template. And there's two main functions in here. There's configure services, which are basically where you add all the necessary services that you're going to use in the ASP.NET Core world. And then there's configure, which actually builds the HTTP pipeline of all the things that happen to a web request while it's coming through the web server. So specifically what we're going to be doing here is I'm going to be adding in, uh, I'm going to be adding some services. So I'm going to go up to my services here. And the first thing is, in addition to adding razor pages, let me put this on a new line. 
I'm also going to add Razor Runtime Compilation. This is that thing that's going to allow me to just save and refresh without having to rebuild the whole project when I change the UI. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do add DB context. So I'm going to give a, a database context over to ASP.NET Core so that it can use it in dependency injection. So it'll handle the creation of these contexts and deal with them as needed. So if you look here, this, this function takes a... Uh, well, it takes a bunch of things, but one of the things that it takes is this DB context options builder that we wrote in our constructor. And here's where I'm going to set up the connection to the SQL server. So we're going to say use SQL server, and I'm going to need to import this. So let's import the namespace. And what this function takes is a connection string. So we're going to grab that out of our configuration. If you remember, we uh, had that in our um, app settings.json file, and we called the connection string wiki. So this here corresponds with this connection string. So whatever you put in here is how it's going to connect. So that's pretty much it. Now at this point, nothing different is going to happen. If I run the application, we're going to get the same exact thing that we got before. There's not going to be any special log messages. The database won't get created. And the reason for that is because we haven't actually done anything that uses a database yet. That context hadn't, it wasn't a dependency on anything. Nothing needed the database, so nothing created the database. So just to test that everything is working fine, and just to show you here, there's still no database. Refresh this. Still, still no shitty wiki. So I'm going to go to the index page, which is that home page, that canned home page, where it says learn about building web apps with, you know, fuck all this shit. We're just going to remove this. And what I'm actually going to put in here is I'm going to put the number of pages pages in our database. You know, let's just say there are blah pages in the database. So let's let's connect this in and fill this in. So we're going to go to the page model. And when I say page model, it's kind of like the code behind in a web form or a win form. You know, under index.cshtml, there's this index.cshtml.cs. And this is the, the model that backs the, the view. So the terms I'm going to be using, this is the view, basically the, the UI. And this is the page model or the view model. Um, so it already has a constructor here and it's already creating a logger so that I can log things. But I'm also going to add another dependency. I'm going to say, hey, I need a database. I'm just going to call it DB. And I'm going to create a private reference to my database here. Uh, it can be a, pro no, it doesn't need to be a property. No one cares. And I'm just going to grab a reference to that real quick. Let's go back into our database and add the DB set of page, and we're going to call that pages, get set. There we go. So this line actually creates the relationship between the database and the table of pages that are going to need to exist. So now back into our, our view model over here, I can say public I enumerable of page pages is a read-only property that will return db.pages. So now, in my view, instead of this pound sign, I can actually say there are model.pages.countPages .pages in the database. Now let's run this and see what happens. It'll take a second here. This only happens on the first chime. You can see there are zero pages in the database, and if you look over here at the log, the database was created. And sure enough, if I go in a SQL server and refresh, refresh, there we go, the database is here. If I open it up, it has one table, which is pages, and if I open that up, it's got one column, which is ID. So I didn't have to do any of this. I didn't have to touch anything in the database. So this approach is called the code first approach. I sit here and I create classes and I create relationships and I annotate them with specific attributes that represent indexes or constraints. 
and the system takes care of it for me. It creates the database, it enforces the schema, it does everything that I needed to do. So no longer do you need a DBA just to start coding. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna, actually, let me stop the project. I'm gonna open the package manager console. The fuck is it? And I'm gonna write add migration initial. And this is gonna create a migration. So what a migration does is it is a class that tells your program how to upgrade and downgrade the database so that when you make changes to your code, like let's say you release a new version of your product, if there are clients out there, if there's users that are still using the old version, normally what, what you used to have to do is ship some type of database upgrade script or something that inserts all the columns or changes the database schema to what you need it to be in the current version. Otherwise, your software is going to run into columns that don't exist or it's going to try to insert things into tables that aren't there. So this kind of takes care of all that for you. So you can see here um, the upgrade of the database. It knows that it needs to create a table called pages and that it has an ID and primary key and to downgrade it's going to um, drop that table. So I can actually, if I came in here and I deleted this pages table like that, and I were to do update database, it's actually gonna go ahead and run that migration again. And if I refresh, I should see that that table actually comes right back. So as we go through the project and as I add things to the database, add tables, add columns, add indexes, we're gonna create migrations so that, um, so that the system can automatically insert those schema updates as necessary. We never have to worry about going in here and creating a table or creating a column or really dicking around with any of this. The only reason why we're going to be using SQL Server Management Studio is for debugging and troubleshooting purposes only. So just to expand on that, I'm going to go into my page uh, class and I'm going to add a couple more properties that we're going to need. So we're, we're definitely going to need a name. So each page is definitely going to have a name and also obviously each page is going to have some content and we're also going to say each page is going to have a created by and each page is also going to have a date time which is created at. We'll be creating a lot more columns in here, but for now, this is essentially what we're going to put in here. So just to you know show you exactly what we're doing, I'm going to go ahead and create another migration, and we'll call it page content. It's going to go ahead and do that. And then I can do update database. And if I go over here and refresh and look at my columns, actually, it hasn't run yet. Oh. Let's go ahead and delete this real quick. Boop. Let's do that again. So if I go in here and I look at my columns, I now have all of these columns and I didn't even have to do anything to the database to get those. All right, now let's take a minute to look at how Razor Pages works. So in your project, there's going to be a pages folder and you can see under here, there's an index page and a privacy page and there's also a generic error page. And if I go ahead and open up the index page, you can see this is the page we already edited. This content right here is essentially the content that's unique to each page, but that's not all the content. Obviously there's an HTML tag, there's a body, there's a bunch of scripts. So all of that is defined in the layout. So if I go ahead and open up the layout, you can see this is everything that goes into making a page on this website. And down here where this render body directive is, that's where it kind of transcludes, it, it, it injects the content from the page that you're actually looking at. So let's just look at this real quick. There's a header, there's some metadata, there's the title, there's a style sheet reference, then there's the body. This whole thing right here is the navigation bar that shows up at the top. We talked about the page content. Here's the footer. And then here's where all the scripts are, you know, referenced from. So out of the box, there's references to jQuery, Bootstrap, and it also creates a site specific uh, JavaScript file where you can put your global JavaScript, whatever you want. 
And then at the bottom here is this render section directive. What this does is this allows me to go onto any page I want. And if I wanted to create some scripts, I could go in here and just say, hey, section scripts. And now anything within this section will wind up at that, you know, at the bottom of that layout page. So that if I need something to run after all the, the you know, the, the HTML is rendered, I can do so. I don't have to worry about, you know, having, you know, including it here in, in the page content and all that shit. So. Um, that's pretty much how pages work. So we're going to go ahead and create three razor pages. Um, the first one is going to be pages. Again, I told you this was confusing. The pages page is going to just be a list of all the pages in our wiki. So we're just going to add a pages page. And this will take a second the first time you do it. We're also going to add... Oops, I did not mean to do view and browser. We're also going to add a add page page, which is the, uh, you know, I want to create a new wiki page page where we're going to ask them for, you know, what the title of it is and maybe some other parameters. So if I go in here, I'm going to add a space in here, add page. And then I'm also going to create a page page which is the page, the razor page, that will show us our wiki page. So there's not going to be a razor page for every page in the wiki. There's just going to be this generic page page, which is going to read the, the content from the database and display it on the screen. Now, there's a small little snafu here because Visual Studio is dumb as fuck. Uh, by default, it names your view model, the name of your page, and then the word model. But page model is already the name of the base class. So we're actually going to have to rename this page page model and then in the view up here we're just going to change that up here in the model directive and that'll link them back up together and now we have three pages i'm also going to add a reference um, to the pages page in our nav bar so i'm going to go back to the layout that you just saw and right here in between the home and the privacy links i'm going to add a new link whoa copied too much data there we go. I'm going to say slash pages and I'm going to say pages. Now let's go ahead and run this just to show you what that did. So if you look here, there's the word pages in the nav bar. If I click there, this is the pages page. If I go to slash page, this is the page page. And if I go to add page, this is the add page page. By default, the name of the page before the .cshtml is by default used as the, the page route. So add page goes here, even though you know on, on the page content it's add space page. This is the actual page name as per the, the cshtml file. So now let's work on making that pages page. So real quick, I'm just going to insert a page into the database manually just so that we have something in there. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new GUID manually and go into the database and I'm going to edit the pages table and I'm just going to insert a page, we'll call it test content created at, let's see, uh, 2020 06, 06 is today's date, created by nil and the name of the page is just going to be test. So now we, we have one page in there. If I were to launch that home page, it would say there are one pages in the database. But we're going to go into our pages page Bum, 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 bum. Let's add some quick markup. So let's just say the following pages are in this wiki. I'll create a table. So we'll create a header and we'll create a table body. And in our header, we're going to have a row. And in that row, we're going to have page, which is going to be the page title. Uh, created by, which is going to be who created the page, and for now, created at. And then in the body, we're going to have a list of, you know, all of the, the pages. We're going to have a row for every page that's in the database. So let's go to our view model. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to add a constructor so that we can dependency inject a reference to our database. So we're going to say database db just like we did in the index, um, the index page, and we're gonna have a private reference to our database, and we're just gonna grab that reference like that. And then 
just like in our index page, we're going to create a public I enumerable of page called pages, which is just going to point to db.pages. So that's all we need in our view model. So from the, the view, the UI, we're going to say for each var p in pages, actually model dot pages, and this is going to run for every page that's in the database. We're going to create a row, and we're going to have three columns. Fuck that up. Uh, first, we're going to have the name. Then we're going to have, god damn it. Then we're going to have the created by. I did not. The autocomplete in Razor is really shitty. If you type too fast, the dot really gets, you know, screwed up. There we go. So, you know, the, the Razor syntax is essentially C sharp mixed in to kind of embedded in HTML. And the way that you break into C sharp is that you use the at symbol. And that pretty much means the next token, the next chunk of text that makes sense is going to be C sharp. So these are just expressions. And then obviously this is a for each loop. So, um, and then maybe at the bottom we're going to put a uh, outside of our table. We're going to put a paragraph and we'll just once again reiterate there are model.pages.countPages in the database because we're going to get rid of that index page eventually. So let's go ahead and run this. And this should work. If we go to our pages page, you can see, there we go, we got a table, and there's our one test page that we manually inserted into the database. So you can see already how easy this is. Now I'm gonna make a couple changes here. So one of the references that comes out of the box linked in your project is Bootstrap, which is a UI client-side library, which makes things prettier and more responsive and more mobile-friendly. So one of the things that we're going to do is I'm going to add the class table to the table, and I'm going to add some classes to these um, header columns here. These names might seem a little obscure at first, but if you read the Bootstrap documentation, it's it's really good documentation. And then obviously, you know, once you get an idea of how things are named in Bootstrap, IntelliSense here kind of makes it really easy to find the class that you're looking for. So all I gotta do is add those classes. And now if I run that page, it should look a lot prettier than it did a second ago. It should be properly spaced. And uh, let's see here. Boop. There we go. That looks more like a table than a blob of unkerned text. All right, now let's do something a little bit more complicated. Let's make the page that actually shows you the page content, you know, the heart of our wiki. So we're going to go to our page page over here. And just like we did with the pages page, we're going to go and modify the constructor so that we get a reference to our database, or rather create the constructor. So we're going to create a constructor called page page model. We're going to grab a copy of the database. We're going to dependency inject that. We're going to have a private reference to it. We're going to set that up. And then the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to need the ID of the page that we're going to be showing. So we're going to need to accept the ID as a parameter. So I'm going to create a property called ID, just a regular public property. And I'm going to decorate it with a attribute here. We're going to call it bind property is the attribute that we want. And this essentially tells um, ASP.NET, specifically Razor Pages, that when this page loads, this property gets bound to a parameter, whether it be in the post data, whether it be in the query string, however that parameter is coming in, this binds to this property. So it should populate this property with that value if that value was passed into us. And uh, let's just go ahead and real quick, real quick go to the view and 
in the view, I'm going to make a change up here. Notice this page directive that tells the system that this is a razor page. I'm going to add a string after here, and I'm going to say ID GUID. And this is called a route template. This basically defines the URL format of this page, essentially the route. So, you know, before I could have just gone to slash page to pull this page up, but now I have to go to page slash and put some GUID after it. Um, if I do not do that, we will wind up at a 404. This page now only matches routing for URLs that pass in a GUID. So I could have multiple pages that have the same exact base URL that are triggered based on different types of parameters that get passed in. If I wanted there to be a page page that takes a string, I could do that, etc. So just to show you what we're working with here, I'm going to put some text on the page. I'm going to say the ID of this page is model.id. So I'm going to go ahead and load this. I'm going to show you something that we did not do, which you'll see real quick. It'll be obvious. If I go to slash page, we will get a 404 because we did not pass in a GUID. Now, if I go ahead and I pass in a GUID, for example, this one, you can see that the page actually loaded because we matched the route template. But notice that the GUID did not actually get passed into the page. That ID property did not get set. Why? Why is that? Well, the reason for that is that by default, properties are only bound on a post, not a get. And in this case, we want it to be bound on a get. So in our bind property attribute, we say supports get equals true. And now if I go ahead and run the same thing, that GUID should get passed into the pages page model and it should show up on the page. Let's just do that one more time. Slat, whoop too fast page slash and then just put a GUID in there now you can see that whatever I put in here no matter what GUID it is let's just say seven you can see it gets passed in there so that's how we get arguments passed into our page all right so now we want to actually get that page up on the screen right so the next thing that we're going to need is we're going to need a reference to what page that is so we're going to make a public property called page ref and this is going to be a reference to the page object that we want to, you know, that we're working with, the wiki page. So this is the wiki page. If I hover over here, it's shittywiki.page. This doesn't mean a razor page. This is a page that's in our database. So in this on get, um, this on get function has been here in, in pretty much every page by default. And this fires. Uh, as soon as the browser goes to retrieve the page before the page gets rendered. And we can put any logic we want in here to uh, load the resources we need to render the page. The ID property will automatically be populated by the route template. So here's where we can just do a quick lookup. So we can say page ref equals database dot pages and then we'll do a where clause and we'll say p dot id equals id first or default. So what this is doing is it's going to the database and it's finding the first page where the ID column matches the ID that we were provided. Now we only have to worry about the first page because the ID column is actually the primary key. So there will never be more than one page with the same GUID. So this page ref at this point is either going to be a reference to the page that we want, or it's going to be null if there was no page with that GUID. So we should probably do a quick check for that. So we'll say if page ref is null, then we want to handle that with an error. So typically at this point, what you'd want to do is you'd want to either redirect them to a page that says this page doesn't exist, or what we'll probably do in the future is redirect them to the create page page so that they can create that page if it doesn't exist, like kind of how what MediaWiki and Wikipedia do. But for now, I'm just going to say return not found, which is going to create a 404 for the user. And in order to return not found, instead of this being a void, this needs to be an I action result. I action result is a return value that essentially tells the web server what to do. Am I going to return an error? Am I going to redirect them to a different page? Am I going to return some content? And then if the page was found, we want to return page. Now this page is the page function, page model.page. 
and this creates a page result that renders the page. So this is the same thing as how it was before when this was a void and it didn't return any value. It basically says, okay, we'll just display the page. Um, but we want to display the page with content from the database, right? So um, we have our page ref and it's public. So now on our view, on our UI, we can actually make use of that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is instead of the header being the word page, I want that to be pageref.name. I want that to be the name, actually, sorry, model.pageref.name. I want that to be the name of the wiki page that's being displayed. And then let's say we, we um, show the content. So model.pageref.content. So for now, we're just gonna display the content you know later on we're going to deal with formatting and markdown and markup and you know links and all that shit but for now i'm just going to display what's in the database verbatim and then down here i'm just going to put some metadata so i'm going to say this page was created on model.pageref. see what i mean about the dots created at and then by model.pageref. Created, oh, created by. All right, let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. I'm going to grab the GUID that's in our database for the only page that we have, and we're going to navigate to it. I'm going to do slash page slash that GUID, and you can see there we go. There's the page title, there's the content, and then you can see it was created at 6620. I didn't put a time in when I shoved it manually into the database, that's why it says midnight, and by nil. If I put in a GUID that is not found in the database, I get a 404 error, which is for right now what we want it to do. Make sense? All right, now let's go back to our pages page and make the page titles in there link to the various pages. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to my pages view. And instead of just displaying the name of the page, I'm gonna make this a hyperlink. Just gonna use standard old HTML, a href. And the link that we're gonna link to is gonna be slash page slash p dot id. So that's gonna make it so that we can click on the pages in the pages view so that once we finally have you know multiple pages, we can just open them up. So now I don't have to type anything in the address bar. I can go to pages, I can click test, and there's my test page. And the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add a button so that we can actually create a page. So real quick, let's uh, below the here, let's create a new paragraph. And here we're gonna create a another hyperlink to the add page page. And we're going to say, create page. Now, go ahead and run this real quick. And then I'll show you the benefits of runtime compilation. So if I go to pages here, you can see that there's a create page. It does go to our add page page, which we haven't built yet, but this is not pretty. I want this to be a nice pretty button. So without stopping the project, I'm gonna come in here and I'm going to add a class. I'm gonna say button, button primary. And I'm gonna save this and I'm gonna go back to my browser window that's still open, I'm gonna hit F5. Now, if you look here, it's going to take a second the first time. It's what's actually doing is you're recompiling that page right now. It, it knows that the file changed and it recompiled it on the fly. So I didn't have to stop debugging, rebuild the entire website, you know, and again, it might seem like it takes 10 seconds to build the website. Whoop de doo. What fucking big deal. But when this gets into a huge fucking gigantic enterprise website with tons of projects, hundreds of pages and all kinds of build steps, you do not want to have to sit there and stop the, the debugging, which is going to kill your Chrome window, and then rebuild the entire fucking thing just to make a stupid markup change like that. So that's where that runtime compilation that we added comes in real hand. And you'll see that throughout, you know, anytime that we don't have to touch the model or the view model, we can just make our changes, save and refresh. So let's go ahead and actually create 
this this add page page. So what I want to do here is I want to ask for the name of a page that the user wants to create. So I'm going to have a field for the the page name, and then I'm going to have a create button, which is going to create the page. We'll we'll add more bells and whistles later. Again, I'm just demonstrating the fundamental foundation of how this is going to work. So let's go ahead and leave our project running since we're only making UI changes. I'm going to go to my add page page. And let's throw in, you know, some text here. Adds a new page to this wiki. And then we're going to create a form. And the method is going to be post. And we're going to create some divs. I'll show you what these divs. The reason I'm creating divs, I'll, I'll, I'll go into in a minute. When we make this a lot prettier, we're going to need these. But for now, I'm just going to create a label um, called page title. And we're going to create an input. Type equals text. And we're going to call it name box and that's where we're going to put the name of our page and this label goes to this input field and then down here we're going to create another div and we're going to put a button type equals submit and we're going to say create page or submit I'll just do create so if I save this and I refresh over here you can see that we have our UI here and now I just need to make this actually do something. So at this point, I'm going to stop the project. And the next thing is we're going to go into the view model and we're going to create our, once again, our constructor. So we're going to say add page model, database db, db equals db. This is a capital D. I didn't create it yet. I'm going to go up here and create it. Private database db so that we have that. And now we're going to create some more properties that get bound to uh, to the, the, the view. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a reference to a page. So we'll once again, we'll call it page ref. And we're going to do a bind property on it. Now this time we don't need to make it accessible from get because it's only going to be uh, used when we create a page when we post that form. So it's only going to be used during the post method, not the get method. And I think that's it. So now we're going to go down here. We're not going to do anything in the on get, but we are going to create a on post. And this is going to get fired when someone clicks the button on that form. Uh, this is erroring right now because we don't, we're not returning anything. So return page. And let's go ahead and put a breakpoint here and run it just to show you that when someone clicks that button, it is going to uh, fire that method. So we're going to do pages, create page. It's going to go here. This doesn't matter yet. When I hit create, boom, it fires this. If I take a look in the watch window at what, you know, what data we have, you can see that we have our page ref, which has been instantiated. So in other words, uh, ASP has created a new page object, but you know, the, the name that was typed into this box here, didn't really come across and the reason for that is that we haven't really bound it to anything this text box is just a text box on an HTML form it's not really connected to anything yet so the way that we're gonna actually connect it is we're gonna use what's called a tag helper so let's go back to our view and right here we're gonna use notice how when I type ASP we get that ASP dash dot 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 and these are all tag helpers these are not HTML attributes that are going to get sent to the client. These tell the server side processor things that have to happen upon rendering. So I'm going to use the ASP4 tag helper, which is actually going to bind the value of this text box to a property value in the view model. So we're going to say page ref dot, and this is actually going to get bound to the name of the page. So now, when someone clicks that post button and this fires, this page ref is not only going to be uh, instantiated to a new page object, but the name at, uh, property on that page object is going to be filled in with the name that the user typed in. So I'm going to fill in some other things here real quick. I'm going to fill in the created at with the current time. And in our next video, we're going to 
create some user accounts. We're going to tie in authentication, but for now it's completely, you know, userless. So I'm going to set the created by to the user's IP address. I'm going to do that by uh, referencing request.httpcontext.connection.remoteipaddress.toString. So request is a reference to the, the request that's being made, and it has a bunch of properties, but HTTP, HTTP context references the whole context of what's happening. The request, the response, the server, the connection, everything that is currently in scope for this HTTP transaction that the server is processing. The connection property references a connection info class, which has data about where this connection is coming from. The remote IP address, which is the client's IP, the local IP address, which is the server's IP, port numbers, whether it's secure or not, the protocol, all that. So we're just gonna do this, and this is gonna give us the IP address in string format of the, you know, the user. Now I'm doing this on my own machine, so this is gonna be local host, it's gonna be, colon colon one if we're using ipv6 or 127.0.0.1 if we're using ipv4 but if this was on the internet this would represent the ip address that the user was connecting from and then at this point i'm going to add the page to my database i'm going to say db.pages.add page ref and i'm also going to force uh save changes which is going to make sure that before we move forward with spitting the uh, the result back to the user that the database has saved the changes and that the database has done anything necessary like filling in default values uh, primary keys if they're database generated all that good shit and instead of returning the same page that the user is already on which would make it look like nothing happened we're actually going to redirect them so we're going to do redirect 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 to page and we're going to send them back to the pages page and then that'll give them obvious feedback because then they'll see this new page listed there so let's go ahead and try this out um i think yeah we did remove that breakpoint so now if i go into pages create page we're going to say testing two and if i click create boom we now have a testing to page. There's my IP address and there's the time and date when it was created. Now there's obviously a couple problems with this. The first of which is that we could just create a page that has no name, which we really don't want. And the second thing is that we could create another page that has the same exact name, which we also don't want. So let's look at how we resolve the first issue first. So let's go in here and delete these empty names from our database. Bom, bom, bom. So there's a bunch of ways to solve this. We could write custom logic to look at that, but one of the easiest things is if we go to our page class, we can simply go to the name property and add the required attribute here. And if I go ahead and I'm gonna have to import the namespace, this essentially tells ASP.NET, Razor Pages system that um, this is required. If we try to post content to a page where this property is bound to something, it will fail validation because this is required. I could also use a constraint like minimum length. For example, we don't want any blank pages. Each page has to have at least one character of content. Maybe we'll say five characters just to be more realistic. And these constraints will be automatically enforced by the system. I don't have to write any custom logic for this. Now, the only thing that I really have to do is I have to make sure that the page passes validation. So in our on post here, we're just gonna write an if statement. And we say that if the model state isn't valid, so in other words, if not model state is valid, then we will just return page. We'll just not go further. We'll just return back to the same page. And then we'll show you in a second how we can actually spit a meaningful error message onto that page. Um, actually, before we um, move forward, I'll actually put on the page, let's see, where is that view? Let's just put a span here. And 
this span, you know, will contain the error that we, you know, that we that we have for this particular field, whether it be, you know, the, the not long enough or you don't it's required and you don't have a value in here. And the way that we tie it in is with another tag helper. So we do ASP validation for whoa page ref dot name. So now if we go ahead and launch this and we try to do the same shit we should actually get an error message. So we'll go into pages, create a page, and just hit create. There we go, the name field is required. Now if I go ahead and put a valid name in here, then it will go ahead and continue on with its life. Um, the other check that we wanna do is we wanna make sure that there actually is not already a page with this name. So in our view model we can do a check here and we can say if db.pages.where p p dot name equals page ref dot name dot count dot count is greater than zero then you know here we can say a uh, page already exists and we'll deal with that error message later. But the effect here is that I can no longer create the same page over and over again, and I can also no longer create a page that has no name. So let's just check that out real quick. Go ahead and do this. So obviously this still presents an error. And if I go ahead and try to create another testing too, nothing happens. We'll deal with handling that error later when we actually go into um, rendering status messages and shit like that. But for now, we have the necessary constraints to keep our database from getting corrupted or fucked up or whatever. Now, before we go any further, before we stop our project, let's work on beautifying this uh, this markup here so that it is bootstrap compliant. So we're gonna go to our view over here and we're gonna do a couple things. The first thing is we're gonna beef up our button with the button and button primary class as you saw before. Where it's gonna make that into a cute little blue button. So if we refresh this, uh, actually we don't wanna refresh it, we just wanna re-navigate to it. Uh, this create button is now a beautiful blue create button. And then the next thing that we want to do is we want to add some classes into this stuff over here to make this uh, what's called a form layout or form group. So each of these controls is going to be nested inside an input group, which is nested inside a form group. So da -da 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 -da, like so. And then our input is actually going to get the class form control. And what that's going to do is it's going to do a couple things. Um, but first, this label belongs outside of the input group. There we go. So this is going to make the controls scale properly to the dimensions of the window, which is going to be very helpful for mobile devices. And as we have more controls on here, more inputs other than just page title, we're going to get the proper spacing you know, between them. And one other thing that I'll do in here is I'm going to create uh, a small, and I'm going to say form text, and I'm going to say this is the title that is shown on this wiki page. And this is kind of like a description for that field. And you can see that shows up here in the place you would expect. Now one problem is that Bootstrap and ASP use completely different classes for their automatic validation shit. So if I actually go ahead and click create, this kind of shows up over here on the side. It doesn't show up red, it doesn't highlight this, it doesn't look right. So the way that we marshal this ASP validation error into a bootstrap validation error is pretty simple. If I actually inspect these, you know, this chunk of the page here, and I go to this, let's make this bigger. Um, you can see here that the text box has already been given the class input validation error, but that's that's an ASP class. That's not um, a class that Bootstrap uses. So if I say is invalid, now you can see that it's red. 
and that's the way that bootstrap properly shows it so let's let's make some changes here real quick the first change i'm going to make is that the span that asp is going to spit the error message into i'm going to surround in a div because bootstrap wants a div for this particular use case and i'm going to give it the class invalid feedback so if i go ahead and refresh this page Let's minimize this real quick. And I do that. Um, nothing happens. And the reason for that is because Bootstrap will not show the invalid feedback unless the control is actually in an is invalid state. So if I go in here and I add that is invalid class again, now I'm going to get the, the control in red and I'm going to see that error message. So in essence, this span doesn't even have to be a custom error message. I could just type in here, you know, there's something wrong with this field. And that text will never be seen unless this control has the is invalid class on it. Now we're just going to put a little kludge in here so that we don't have to do this manually and I don't have to do it on every page. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm actually going to go into my layout page. So we're going to go into shared layout. And at the bottom here, below the page specific scripts, I'm going to add a new script. And I'm going to say, oops, not Razor, jQuery. When the document is ready, so in other words, when the uh, when the page DOM has been loaded, we're going to do a couple things. Basically, the biggest thing we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, anything that has an input validation error on it, we want to add a class called is invalid. And this is basically just going to transform this ASP error into a bootstrap error. So if I go back here, again, without even recompiling, if I control F5 so that everything is reloaded, now, here, let me uh, re-navigate so that you can see that it happens organically. See, now it shows up properly without me having to do anything. So now this page is pretty, our error shows up, and this turns red. And you know, likewise, if I go in here and I put a proper page name in here, let me close this. It creates it, no problem. I can click on it to navigate to that page. Working pretty well, cooking with gas now. Now the last thing I want to implement in this video is some friendly URLs. So if I, you know, if I go to one of these, you can see this is not a very friendly URL. If I paste this to a friend, it's completely not obvious what this is. We want it to be like Wikipedia where it's, you know, our, our host name slash and then the name of a page. We, we want to be able to be like, hey, testing five or whatever. Now, this part of it, this testing five, this needs to be separate and distinct from the page's name. And the reason for that, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, we don't want there to be spaces in the URL. Spaces are going to get escaped as a percent 20, which is ugly. It's hard to read various reasons why you don't want to do that. There's going to be other characters that you're going to want in your page title that you're not going to want in your URL. You also might not want your page URL to be as long as the page title. If someone makes a really long titled page, there might be a good reason for that, but you don't want the URL to be that long if it doesn't need to be. So what you want to do is you want to introduce a property on a page called a URL slug, which is essentially this chunk of the URL. It's like a friendly title, a URL friendly name for each page. So one way that we're going to do that, let's go ahead and stop debugging and let's go into our model, our, our page class. And we're going to add a string called slug. And because we changed our schema, I'm going to go into the package manager and I'm going to add a migration. Call it slug. And we're going to, come on, we're going to update the database. Oh, build failed because I accidentally started typing up there. Oops. Happens quite frequently, actually. And that's done. So if I go in here and I, oops, I did not mean to do that. If I refresh the columns on this thing, you can see that we now have a column for our slug. So we have a place to store that. And let's go into our add page page. 
and let's copy this entire div here and add a new field. And we're gonna, instead of name box, we're gonna call it slug box. And we're gonna call it URL slug. And the name is gonna be slug, or the ID is gonna be slug box. It's gonna be data bound to the slug property. We're gonna validate the slug property. And we're gonna change the description here. We're gonna say this is a URL friendly identifier that will be used in the URL of this page. In the friendly, um, I said friendly way too many times, that's good enough. And one thing that I might wanna do is go back over here and put a minimum length on this so that it's gotta be at least five and maybe a maximum length of let's say 100 just for kicks, right? So that's gonna constrain our slug to be relatively friendly. Now at this point, it will work. If we go ahead and uh, create a page, we could type a slug in there. Let's just test some validation out real quick. We're gonna go to pages, create page, testing seven. So um, we didn't make it required. So the URL slug might be blank, in which case the page has to be referenced. Hold on, essential craftsman, we don't wanna look at you. Now this can still be blank because we um, didn't make it required. Not all pages might want a URL slug, like think about a private page or an internal page or what have you. So it doesn't have to be required, but we do want to make sure that we can't just put a single character in here. There we go. The field slug must be a string with a minimum length of five. And if we put a really long one in here, that's clearly over 100 characters. Actually, it's interesting. We can't even type more than 100 characters because the uh, text input has already been limited to the maximum number that was uh, a constraint on the, the data bound property. So as you can see here, I can't even type more than 100 characters. So awesome sauce. Now, the next thing I wanna do is I want the page title to be um, copied into the slug so that someone doesn't have to sit here and then also type the same exact thing again and type testing seven or whatever. We want, as soon as someone types the page title, we want a recommended slug to automatically show up. So let's let's go ahead and create some JavaScript real quick. So in our pages page, or rather our add page page, we're gonna go up here and we're gonna create a section called scripts. And remember, anything that's inside this section is gonna get rendered onto the page at the very bottom into the script section. So I can safely put a script here and write a function called form slug. And this is what's going to form the slug that we, you know, that we need. So let's just do uh, var text equals use jQuery to get the value of the name box. And let's do some very rudimentary uh, manipulation for now. Again, we're going to come back later and make this exactly what it needs to be. But let's just replace spaces with hyphens. Let's just do that. And then we'll say slugbox.value is text. And then we can just use a client side on change event. So here's our name box. So we can just say on change equals form slug. So complete straight JavaScript, no ASP, nothing, no C sharp in here for that. So we just save our page, come back here. Uh, let's renavigate the page. And let's see if that works. So testing seven, and as soon as I hit tab, now we have a friendly slug here. And if I go ahead and create that, um, we don't have a slug column, but if I go into the database and I select all, you can see that the slug has been populated for that page. Perfect, now we just need to make it work, right? So how do we make it work? So if you remember on our page page, this represents what comes after the page name in the route. So in other words, um, let's make a comment this time. If I do anything slash page and then a slash, this part right here is what matches up against the route template. Now there's two reasons why we can't use this for this friendly URL shit. Number one is that we're limited to a single route template in this page directive. I can't just type comma and then you know slug like that. I can't just add another route by doing that, unfortunately. 
the other thing is that we don't really want to. We don't want to have a route that's uh, that's in this form because we don't want to have to type slash page slash slug. We just want to be able to type slash slug, just like you know Wikipedia. I don't have to go to you know slash page dot php slash the name of the page. I just go to the name of the page. So the way that we accomplish this is by adding a page route. So if we go back to our startup class over here. If we go back to our configure services, we, we're adding Razor pages, we're adding Razor runtime compilation, and then on top of that, we're going to add Razor options. And what we're going to use is we're going to do something called conventions. I'm sorry, it's add Razor pages options. Conventions. And conventions essentially tells the routing system hey, anytime you see something that looks like this, here's how I want you to route it. So in here we have a number of options, um, all kinds of interesting shit, but what we really care about is add page route. And this takes two parameters. It takes a page name and a route. So the page name is going to be slash page, because that's our page page. And the route template that we want to use here is very simple, slash slug. So essentially any time that someone types anything in the URL, anything in the path, that does not match any other routes. In other words, it's not an existing page, it's not an existing route. It will get routed over to this page and it will capture that text into the slug parameter. Now, we need to set up a, a property that's bound to slug so that we can capture this value. So let's go to our page page and write the code to make this work. So in our page view model, you can see that we're already capturing our ID here. So we're just going to do the same thing. We're going to say public string slug, make it a property, and the same thing. Bind property supports get is true. So that way, if someone arrived at this page using the ID, the ID property will be filled in. And if someone arrives at this page using the slug, then the slug property will be filled in. So all we really need to do is modify our page lookup logic here. So we just say, hey, if the uh, is null or empty slug, actually, if the slug is null or empty, if we didn't get a slug, then look the page up by ID. Otherwise, do the proper bracing here. Woo. Otherwise, we want to look the page up by its slug. And everything else still holds true. If the page was not found because someone typed in gobbledygook, then we're going to, for now, we're going to give them a 404. In the future, we're going to say, hey, do you want to create this page? But that should, that should be it. So let's take a look. I should be able to just do slash testing dash seven and be taken to the testing seven page. So we're going to do dash testing dash seven. And what do you know? It works. So now we have friendly URLs. The last thing I want to implement with regard to slugs is that if we go to our pages page and I hover over these, you can see that they're still um, linking to the ID. So if they have a slug, we want to be able to use that slug. That way, if someone comes in here and copies the URL, they copy the friendly URL. And again, I don't have to stop compilation. Actually, I'm going to stop compilation because I want to create a property for this. So I'm going to go to my page model. Not my page model, my page model, my page class. And I'm going to create a public property called path. And I'm basically going to say if slug, uh, I'm sorry, if the slug is null or empty, then we're going to return one thing. And if we have a slug, we're going to return slash slug. If we don't have a slug, we're going to return slash page slash ID. And we need a semicolon. So whether this page has a slug or not, this path property is going to return the absolute path of where to link the user to on our website. So now if I just go into the pages view, I instead of this, I can just do p.path. And let's just make sure that that works. And then we should be golden. pages. So if I hover over, if I 
open up testing two, you can see that it uses the URL because it doesn't have a slug. If I open up testing seven, you can see that it uses the friendly URL. So easy peasy, butterfly cream. So that takes us to the end of the video. In the next video, we're gonna create the page that actually edits the page, the content, and we're gonna um, hook into user authentication so that we can actually authenticate users and have permissions and all that good shit. If you have questions about anything I've done, post a comment below, I'll answer every one of them. And if you noticed anything that I did that you would have done differently, or I did anything the long way and there's an easier way, make a comment. If you like the video and you want to see more in this series, you know, like, subscribe, consider supporting me on Patreon. And uh, hopefully within a couple of videos, we're going to have a really awesome fucking wiki. So that wraps it up. Stay safe out there, guys. Ciao. What?